Good morning. Happy Lord's Day, everyone. Welcome to Westminster. Welcome to those of you that are visiting with us, whether for the first time or uh, frequent visitors. We're happy to have you. We do have the visitor cards that you'll find in the pew back in front of you. Just basic contact information that'll help us to uh, get in touch with you and greet you more fully at a later time. Uh, we're happy that you're here. A couple of announcements. September 25th, you all should have received an email about a week or so ago, maybe a week and a half. We are going to be having a congregational meeting on Sunday morning, immediately after morning worship. Uh, for the purpose of nominating three deacons, um, we have Logan Hartke, we have Jonah Hallahan and Tim Broadwick that are going to stand for election at this time. And uh, also at that meeting, we are going to elect a third officer of the corporation for Westminster Presbyterian Church to represent us to the state. So that should be a relatively quick meeting, um, we anticipate. So if you'd please, members, um, hang around a little bit after on the 25th and we'll transact that business. Additionally, uh, I'd like to remind you all that Wednesday nights, we are continuing our study through Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. It's going great so far, and um, if you do plan on coming, we would ask you to be so kind and to send an email to Ethan, letting him know that you're coming, so that way he can prepare enough food for everyone. And then also, finally, next week, on Sunday, September 11th, hard to believe, uh, we are going to have a second Sunday fellowship meal Tommy Park and I have conversed, and he intends to bring some RUF college students with him here. So we would ask you to please bring enough for yourself, visitors, and hungry college students. <laughs> we want to feed them. If they come, we want to feed them. So we would uh, encourage you next week, members, visitors alike, bring something with you. We'll share a great time of fellowship together and encourage the new students at UNF. With these matters concluded, let's prepare our hearts now for the worship of the living of the true God. Good morning. morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. The call to worship is Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Our hymn of adoration is Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, O oh my God, O oh my soul. It's in number 57 in the Trinity Hymnal. Please stand if you're able.
Let us pray. Lord God, you love us more than we can know. You choose us from the very beginning to be family. You come with joy to worship you. We rejoice in you, Lord, for you are with us. You are our salvation, and in you alone we trust. Lord, you draw us home to live by streams of living water where there shall be no thirst. You are given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. You know our thoughts, and you understand our hearts. God of grace, you enable us to become the people we were meant to be. Thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to come to your house to worship you, the true living God. Fill us with your spirit that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, glorious Lord, receive our praise and adoration that we may be blessed by our worship. Speak to us through your word that we may hear your guidance for our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. confession of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed. It's found on page 845 in the Trinity Hymnal. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and buried he descended into hell the third day arose again from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead I believe in the Holy Ghost the church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can see, be seated now. The reading of God's law comes from Exodus 20, verse 8, and the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 58. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What's required of the fourth amendment, the fourth of constant, first commandment, I'm sorry. The fourth In Psalm 92, we have the principle that's laid out for us here in our Shorter Catechism on why we are to set apart 
the whole day for the purposes of God's worship. Psalm 92 is a psalm, it's a song for the Sabbath. And verses 1 and 2 read, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, at the works of your hands I sing for joy. Worship uh, in the Jewish conception was not relegated to a part of the day, or to a particular hour, but the whole of the day was to be spent in both the public and the private exercises of God's worship. And so we would it's command, I mean, God's word commands that we would sanctify the whole of the Sabbath day. Now, even those of you who try to keep this have not done so perfectly. I haven't either. And so because we have failed to set aside the whole of the day, and free ourselves from earthly cares and worldly recreations. We stand guilty before God's law. But the good news is, is that when we come and when we pray, we come to a father who is ready and able to forgive his children of their sins against him. And so I'm going to have us pray silently and privately to start, and then I'll pray for the body. Let's bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we thank you for the opportunity, one day in seven, to be feared or to be freed from earthly cares for the express purpose of worshiping you, glorifying you, and enjoying you on all of this holy day. Father, we confess that all too often we are reluctant to come to church and we are all too quick to punch out when service is over. We get our fill. We get our jumper cables worth of preaching, the means of grace for the week, and then we continue about the rest of the Sabbath day living as though it were any other day of the week. When in fact, Lord, you have set aside the whole of this day. You rested the whole of the seventh day and therein set a model for us that we too are to rest and to find our rest in worship. To find our rest in personal communion with you with the body, personally in our homes. And Lord, too, you, you have not commanded an onerous task. You, you even tell us that we are to rest physically in addition to spiritually, but the priority is on the spiritual. And all too often, Lord, we have called convenience rest and preferred it over your worship, which we have called inconvenient. Father, forgive. We pray, Lord, that you would work into our hearts a love for your law, that just as the psalmist delighted in your law as the honeycomb, so too we would delight in your law as it is opened for us and as your gospel is preached on the Sabbath day. Make this the best day of our week. Make this the day that we prepare for, that we clear our calendars for, that we anticipate and we relish and we savor the opportunity to sing praises to you, and to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ on this day. Lord, we are a restless people, but you are a good God that has given us a weekly opportunity to rest in your finished work, our redemption through your Son. Help us to do this, Lord. Help us to rest content in that which you have revealed and that which you have offered us on this day. And cause us, Lord, to worship with all of our heart, with all our souls, strength and mind, in the manner that you have prescribed. We thank you for worship. We pray that through your spirit, you would enable us to worship you more fully. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God's assurance of pardon for all those that are guilty, left to themselves, but cleansed through Jesus' blood. He writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Now, we're going to now have the time where we continue on our worship. We give to the Lord tithes and offerings, but a mere portion of all that he's given to us. We're going to sing together, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place, number 468 in the Red Trinity Hymnal. Please stand. praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that indeed our souls have found a resting place, that we need no other plea when we come before the judgment seat of God, for we have Jesus Christ's name that is put upon us like a banner, that we are clothed in his righteousness, that there is no condemnation, there is no fear, for fear has been banished, it has been cast out, for we have laid our hopes upon Jesus Christ alone. He is the sufficient Savior, the sufficient High Priest. He is the prophet who has revealed for us everything necessary for our salvation. He is the King who conquers all of his and our enemies and who subdues us to himself as a shepherd king. Who, Though we go astray, he brings us back with his shepherding crook. And all those enemies that would seek to destroy us, he beats them away with the rod. We thank you for Jesus Christ who walked through the valley of the shadow of death before us so that when we are called to walk through deep valleys and dark providences, we know that our Lord Jesus has been there too, that he can sympathize with us even now, that he feels and identifies with us what we suffer. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Were the words of our risen Savior. And so, 
as the afflictions are added up in your people, Lord. We thank you that Jesus pleads for us, that he holds us, that he maintains our lot, and that we shall not be moved, for he is immovable at your right hand. We pray, Father, for the families of this church, that you would grow them in godliness. As we're going to study today, we pray for the husbands and wives, that they would have marriages that are marked by those virtues you've commanded in your word. And Lord, we pray for the children that proceed from these marriages. We pray for the little ones of the church, that you would convert their hearts. It is not enough that they are mere external members of the covenant, though a privilege that is. But Lord, you need them to be savingly united to your son. And so we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon the children of this church, that they may believe, that they would forsake their sin, that they would flee to Jesus Christ. We pray and thank you for the Sunday school teachers that teach these children and do so with excellence and care for their souls. We pray for the adult education here at the church and thank you for those who labor in teaching. Pray that you would equip them and give them spiritual insight in order that they might shepherd and disciple the flock. We pray for the elders of the church, Lord, and thank you for them personally. As a member of session, it's, it's, it is good and it is for the good of your church that godly men should preside over her. We pray that you would bless these under shepherds with all the spiritual graces that they need to do their job well. We thank you for the deacons and all the ways in which they serve quietly, unauspiciously, and so essentially. We thank you for their counting of the tithes. We thank you for their maintenance of the building and also for their ministering to the poor and those that come to the church seeking benevolence. Thank you for their hearts. We pray for the upcoming deacon candidates and we pray that they will be nominated and um, that the church would be satisfied in their qualifications for this office. And Father, we pray that you would strengthen the hands of these men. Bless the wives in our congregation, Lord. Bless them as they partner alongside their husbands to subdue the earth, to multiply, to bring it under dominion, and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in every sphere. And we also pray for the singles in our congregation, Lord. We pray for them that whether they desire marriage or whether it is not something to which they are called, that they would, too, serve you with the best of their gifts, not the reserves or those things that are left over, but that they would, as it were, be wedded to the church, serving her and laying down their lives for the sake of the body here. Show them their essential place in this church, and God, if they do desire spouses, we pray that you would grant that desire of their hearts. Father, bless these tithes and these offerings. We are um, just very excited at um, the news of a morning meeting place being secured and um, our gracious neighbors at the Seventh-day Adventist Church being willing to open that space to us. And there's so much progress, Lord, so many good things happening. And cause us not to forget, as you warned the wilderness generation, that when they go into the promised land and prosperity abounds, they, they would forget you. God, help us to learn that lesson, but not the hard way. Let us see that every blessing comes from your hand, and so all praise is due to you in good times and in bad, in happy providences and in hard. Bless all the details that need to take place between now and then, and we pray, Father, for a church that is unified in all the ways it is important, not over the color of the carpet or the uh, different aesthetics, as lovely as they will be, but help us to be a people set upon one voice in worship, one heart as we listen to and receive your word, and of one mind as we take this word out into the world that so desperately needs to hear it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We continue in our reading through God's word. We went through the table of the nations. Descendants from Adam all the way to Noah. We saw Enoch, who was taken up by the Lord. Having walked with God, he was taken up, he did not die. And we also saw in chapter 5 that these people lived an awful long time. And they really did live that long. They really lived, Methuselah, up to 969 years. And why is that? Well, because these people were so close to the original creation of Adam 
You remember, he was made in perfection. And so it seems that as time goes on, there is diminishing returns, you might say. And so here now is the um, post-flood, you know, men, his life will be 70, maybe 80 years. Um, it seems that we see the fall and the toll that the fall takes with the passage of time in chapter 5. And we will see that that corruption is not just limited to age, but that corruption also affects man in his mind. That his heart is set on evil, it is deceptive, and it is wicked by nature. This is what the Reformed call total depravity. Uh, we believe that sin touches the totality of our being. We believe that there is not one pure vestige in us. Though the knowledge of God can never be erased, nor his image be altogether destroyed, it is marred. Like throwing paint up on a window. It's still there. It's not altogether broken. But the image is obscured. And all due to sin. And we see that growing corruption and prompting the necessity of the flood in here in Genesis chapter 6. This is God's word. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, that is the children who believed, these are men, not angels, saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined... To make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above. And set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kind, and of the animal according to their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Amen. What we're going to do this month is we're going to start a new psalm. You should find this in the inside front cover of your hymnal. It is a full sheet. Uh, Emily was actually so kind, she contacted uh, Nathan George to get permission to use this hymn. He's a PCA uh, staff member at Christ's Covenant, where Kevin DeYoung is pastor. So it's great to support good folks in the PCA doing great work. And so we're going to sing Psalm 14. It is a new hymn. It's a new, uh, forgive me, melody. So I'll have Emily play through it one time, and then we'll join together with our voices.
nicely with Genesis 6. Everyone has turned aside, all have gone astray, and yet the Lord seeks us. Amen. Well, would you take up your Bibles now and stand for the reading of God's Word? We'll come to Colossians chapter 3 this morning, and we'll consider verses 18 and 19 together. Colossians 3, 18 and 19. Oh, and by the way, we're going to reuse these for the, um, uh, the psalm for this month, so if you just tuck it back into your hymnal, that would be a great help. Okay, Colossians 3, beginning in verse 18, this is God's holy, inerrant, and life-giving word. Wives, submit to your husbands, as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray that you would bless it to us now. Lord, that we would receive your word in all of its parts, not just the parts that we prefer. Uh, and as this text is very personal, Lord, we do pray for wisdom for the preacher. We pray for receptive hearts uh, on the part of the hearers. And Lord, that this would abound in a harvest of righteousness here at Westminster. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In the year 2000, there were no fewer than 944,000 divorces in the United States alone. Compared to the year 2020, there were only 630,500 divorces. Now, based on that statistic alone, you might be left to conclude marriages much, must have improved over that period of time, right? Things must be looking up for marriage. But when you consider that there were 2.3 million marriages in the year 2000 compared to only 1.6 million in 2020, suddenly the picture becomes clearer. The divorce rates were lower because marriage rates were lower. Fewer people are pursuing and desiring after marriage. The question becomes why? Why is it that the estate of marriage has declined in popularity over the last two decades? You could give any number of answers to that question. But I, I think that, and most basically, previous generations saw the institution of marriage as having a net positive benefit, a net benefit both to the marrying individuals and society at large, whereas prevailing attitudes are that marriage is positively harmful. At best, it is antiquated and no longer necessary, and at worst, it is contrary to personal satisfaction, fulfillment, in the pursuit of happiness. Marriage, many believe, is where men go to be emasculated. It is where women go to be abused and enslaved, and where divorce is all but inevitable. And with such popular attitudes like these, is it any wonder why people avoid marriage today like they do the plague? In light of such prevailing negative attitudes, it is absolutely essential for believers of all people to recapture and to appreciate afresh the real meaning of marriage and how to fulfill the God-given roles of husband and wife in that estate of marriage. A marriage will only be as healthy as it is biblical. Your marriage will only be as healthy as it is biblical. When marriage functions according to God's design and to God's aims, it is both satisfying to the husband and wife it is a joy to the children that are born from their marriage, and is it an evangelistic display of the gospel. It puts on display for the watching world the kind of love that Christ Jesus has for his bride, the church. Friends, if the church is to thrive and be united as one, as Paul has commanded of late in chapter 3 of the Coloss to his letter to the Colossians, then the call to oneness must necessarily extend to our particular marriages. If the church is to be one, then husbands and wives need to be one. They need to be of one flesh, of one heart, and one mind. Now, for those of you here today that are not married, let me say that you are not free to check out this morning. You don't get a week off. Because there's something here for you, too. 
Though you may not be married now, God's mysterious providence sometimes brings people into our lives that we never expected he would. You may be married one day. And so, the time to start cultivating these masculine and these feminine virtues is not once you get married, it is long before. We mustn't sit on our hands and wait to be married to start getting sanctified. These virtues are something that we can, to a degree, cultivate within ourselves by the power of the Spirit even before we're married. And even if you never marry, marriage is not just a teaching tool for those that are married themselves, but marriage is a sign to the whole of the church of the love that Jesus Christ has for the church. Marriage is a teaching tool that Jesus uses to show his love for you. And you don't need to be married to enjoy that love or to participate in it. So there is something here for everybody. Marriage is a worthy study for the single and the married alike. Paul's command this morning is very brief. It is very brief. It is very straightforward. But as short as it is, you all know, don't you, that countless books have been written on the subject of marriage. And it's impossible to do anything other than just to skim the surface of all the applications and all the manifold applications of this text. But we do need to fulfill this command, and so we're going to spend a great deal of our time today using verses 18 and 19 to explore how marriage works best. What a marriage that is according to God's design looks like. What our marriages need more, now more than ever is they need to return back to God's ordained original design for them. What the text shows us this morning ought to strengthen and sweeten your marriage. If we are faithful to heed these commands of Paul, then the benefit will be sweetened and strengthened marriages. That is God's design in inspiring this text. It's Paul's intention in writing it, and it is my intention for you in preaching it, that the marriages of Westminster would be strengthened and sweetened. What I want us to see from this text, most basically, is this, that our marriages need to be marked by joyful submission in loving leadership. That the marks of the Christian marriage are joyful submission and loving leadership. Marriage equals submission and love. Now I will say at the outset before jumping in that Paul's fuller treatment of marriage is spelled out for us in Ephesians chapter 5 towards the end of the chapter. It's another one of his prison epistles. Philemon, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And so there are some parallels there's some overlap between Colossians 3 and Ephesians chapter 5. So if you hear me using language that you don't see immediately in the text in front of you, it's probably because I'm channeling Ephesians 5. They've both bled together in the study this week. So with that in mind, we look first at the duties of the wife as they are commanded there in verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands. And when you say the word submission, it has this way of sucking the air out of the room, doesn't it? Submission has become something of a dirty word in today's culture, and not just in the culture, also in the church. It is profoundly uncomfortable. If you can use any other word, people say use it. And yet, submission is a biblical word. Submission is a biblical word. But people use it in an unbiblical fashion an awful lot, which is why people are reticent to talk about it. So what we're going to do with each of these two points this morning, joyful submission and then loving leadership, we're going to first talk about what each is not and then what each is. So first, let's talk about what joyful submission is not. First, submission does not mean domination, domineering, slavery, or servitude. That is not what submission means. The wife is subject to her husband, but she is not subjugated to her husband. Submission is not slavery. This popular notion has soured marriage in the minds of so many. They think that marriage is repressive upon the wife, that the husband rules with an iron fist, and that whatever he says goes, and the wife is to ask no questions. And it's not just the popular culture that has reacted against this. Even, I would say, evangelical feminists and egalitarians are responding to what is, a what is an abuse of submission 
but are overcorrecting and saying that it is altogether foreign to the New Testament. That's wrong. Many women believe that when you are called to submit to your husband, that it means you no longer have an opinion of your own, that your gifts no longer have real value, that everything you do must be um, in slavish obedience to your husband, and that you cease to have an identity that is your own, that you just become an accessory to your husband. These are lies. That is not what I'm talking about this morning. Notice as well what submission is not. The command is given not to the husband, but to the wife. Submission is commanded of the wife, not the husband. Nowhere in scripture can you find a command where it says, husbands, make your wife submit to you. Make sure that you get her to do whatever it is that you want. This command has no note of compulsion or force in its meaning. I've heard it said before that wives need to be led with a firm hand. I disagree with that statement. Find me anywhere in the New Testament or the Old where it says that a husband is to lead his wife with a firm hand. As we'll see later on, such an encouragement flies in the face of what Paul has to say in verse 19 of this very text. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Do not be bitter towards them, Paul says. The command is given to the wife, and it functions this way. The expectation is that she voluntarily and willingly submits herself to her husband in readiness and love, not under compulsion. That's what Paul has in view. And then the third thing that submission is not, submission is not based upon an intrinsic inferiority of women to men. This command to submit in no way implies that the wife is ontologically, that is in her being, inferior to her husband. Men and women, when you read the Genesis account, were both created in God's image. Male and female, he created them after his own image, not the husband to a greater degree and the wife to a lesser. Scripture doesn't say that. No, we want to be careful here. Though, ontologically, there are differences and distinctions between men and women, contrary to what the world says, contrary to androgyny and paganism, men and women are not just mere hats that we can exchange at will. Men and women are created differently, but that is not implying a stratification of dignity or being. Men have gifts and graces that I would say ordinarily are peculiar to them, and likewise, women have gifts and graces ordinarily peculiar to them. That does not make us better or worse than each other. So in our attempts to affirm the equality of women, we do not want to make it sound as though women and men are identical. Let's keep our distinctions clear, but not build in a hierarchy. And I say this because when you hear ordinarily, and usually when you see a call for the wife to submit to her husband, you will usually find an accompanying reminder to the husband to honor his wife as his equal, as his created equal. 1 Peter 3, 7, likewise husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing honor, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, that does not mean weak-minded, that does not mean inferior intellectually, spiritually, or in terms of worth, it means physically. Show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, co-heirs. I don't see anywhere in scripture where it says that men stand to inherit more in the kingdom of God than women. We are co-heirs. Submission is not grounded upon the inferiority of the wife to her husband. So that's what submission is not. Now what is it? What is submission? If we could say it this way, it is yielding to or obeying another, and in the case of marriage, obeying the higher authority. It is following the lead of your husband. Now authority, there's another word that When applied to marriage, it makes people a bit uneasy. 
Authority does not mean authoritarianism. It is not dictatorial. Authority is also not the consequence of men and their might making it right. Authority is ordained by God. The authority structure in marriage is created by God. Notice what the text says. Submit to your husband as it is fitting in the Lord. It is the Lord's will that you submit to your husband, wives. Not that you submit to all men, but that you submit to your own husband. It is fitting. This is what pleases God. It is in step with what he has commanded in his word. Now, feminist and egalitarian scholars will argue, largely on the basis of Genesis 3.16, that the husband's authority and the wife's submission in marriage began only after the fall. That the husband only began to rule, and that, sinfully, over his wife, and the wife's desire for her husband's authority, that this is all just a consequence of the fall. And so when two Christians are converted... They are to pursue an egalitarian relationship like that which Adam and Eve enjoyed in the garden. No authority, no distinctions between male and female roles. There are countless problems with that view. The first is, is that it flies in the face of what the Apostle Paul writes elsewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that chapter on head coverings. We're not going to talk about the head coverings today, but he tries to set the boundaries for what are proper relationships and how husbands and wives relate to each other in the church. And where he grounds the nature of the wife's submission to her husband is not in the cultural mores or preferences of his day, but in creation itself. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, in his, or in, um, the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, And the head of Christ is God, speaking of Christ in his incarnation. Paul teaches that the Christian husband is to be the head of his wife in a likened way to Christ being the head of the church. Christ is the authority in the church. And so likewise, the husband is to be the head, he is to be the authority in the home. But he mustn't get a big head about it. Husbands, you have been called to be the head, but not to have a big head. Okay? God's word commands it. Jesus is the head over all things, and so the husband is to be head over all things in the home. He continues later in that same chapter, verses 8 and 9. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Adam was made first, and Eve was taken from Adam that he might lead her. And also, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. We'll stop there. That sounds repressive on women, doesn't it? That the woman is created for the man? All this is doing, and all Paul's doing here, is mirroring the very language of Genesis 2.18. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. That Eve was made compatible so as to come alongside as an esther, that is, as an ally, to assist her husband in the dominion mandate. To subdue the earth, multiply, fill it, and to bring all things as as it were a sacrifice pleasing to the Lord. That's what Paul has in view. Paul grounds the husband's authority in the home and the wife's submission to the husband, not in post-fall, but in the pre-fall garden. And very interestingly, Dr. George Knight, he was a seminary professor years ago at, at Greenville, he writes of this text. When Paul wanted to tell the Ephesians, he wrote of the Ephesians, about marriage, he did not just hunt around for a helpful analogy and suddenly think, Christ in the church might be a good teaching illustration. No, it was much more fundamental than that. Paul saw that when God designed the original marriage, he already had Christ and the church in mind. Have you thought of that lately? That Paul didn't just think, this might work, God designed it that way from the beginning. If this is so, then the order Paul is speaking of here, submission and love, is not accidental or temporary. It's not just part of Paul's historical context or culturally determined. 
It is part of the essence of marriage. Love and submission is part of the essence of marriage. God was introducing authority for the first time, not post-fall, but it was baked into the first marriage between Adam and Eve. And when God looked at all that he had made, he said, it is very good. Now, submission is to be acquiescing or showing a deference to one's husband, but it also should be joyful. It should be joyful. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2. Peter, in this context, is commanding wives to submit to their unbelieving husbands, the obvious qualifier, not participating in their sin. Okay? Paul commands even the believing wife to submit to her unbelieving husband insofar as she can for the purpose of showing him the gospel. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. It is not a begrudging or a reluctant submission that scripture calls for. It is a joyful, respectful, and ready submission. And if Peter can say that to a Christian woman who is married to a non-Christian husband, then how much more effective do you think it will be, Christian wife, if you, with your respectful and pure conduct, submit to your husband, don't you think that he'll just love you all the more? That he will rejoice over you? That he will thank God that he has such a godly wife? Of course he will. This does not make you a, a walking mat or a doormat. But this is a way that you model the gospel in your marriage. Now, indeed, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, marriage is a picture of Christ's love for the church. The wife might ask, well, what do I have to go by? What model do I have for my submission? Look at Jesus in his incarnation. It was his meat and it was his drink to do the will of his father. He delighted in the law of the Lord in his inmost being. And even though it pained him to be upon the cross, he did it out of love for his father. And so that is to be a reflection of the wife's love for her husband. Submitting to him will cause you, I hope, to appreciate afresh that when your husband who with this role is doing everything that he can in order to serve you, in order to protect and to guard you and do everything for your well-being, I hope that this is an opportunity for you too to love your husband more as you see him leading self-sacrificially. Now, let's, let's apply this text. This is where the applications, this is where it gets a bit thorny, I might say. Marriage's goal, its highest goal, is not happiness but holiness. Marriage's highest goal is not happiness, it is holiness. Now, we've all heard, and we've probably used the phrase before, happy wife, happy life. And we joke about that. And yet, I do believe that that is how a lot of Christian households actually run. Whether they would say it out loud or not, the wife's happiness becomes the final authority on whether the husband makes his decisions. This is backwards. If a husband will never make a decision unless his wife is in full agreement, this in effect makes her the head of the household. The husband can do the paperwork, but the wife's seal of approval is what makes it or breaks it. Let me say it this way. Holiness and happiness are not exact synonyms. It is possible for a wife to be very happy with how things are going, and yet she may not be holy in that moment. And likewise, it is possible for a wife to be growing in holiness, though she may not be happy about it either. Consider sanctification in general terms with me for a moment. I want to, I want to unpack this. I know that sounds hard, but let's unpack it. Christian, is your growth in holiness always a pleasant experience? Does being made more like Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit always make you happy? 
no. If that's the case, then why would we expect of our marriage, which is the primary arena of our sanctification, by the way, why would we expect our spouse to make us happy all the time? If in your life you're unhappy in your process of sanctification, is that because God has done something wrong to you? Or is it because you are responding wrongly to God's intended good for your life? It is the latter. It is possible for husbands to relinquish opportunities to pursue their wife's sanctification because they are afraid of making them unhappy. And they think that that's their goal. They're, they're here to make their spouse happy. But that is not Scripture's goal for marriage. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 5, says that the husband's goal for his wife ought to be the same as Christ's goal for his bride, which is the church. Is Jesus' goal to make us always happy? No, it is to make us holy. Listen to what Paul writes. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, that she might be holy and without blemish. Christ's intention for his bride is her holiness, and so husband, your highest aspiration for your wife is that she would be holy that she would look more like Jesus today than she did yesterday. Now let me say here that while happiness and holiness are not exact synonyms, ordinarily you should expect there to be overlap. While your wife's happiness, husband, is not your ultimate goal, that does not mean that her happiness is altogether unimportant. There would be something very strange if your wife is a believer who genuinely desires to look more like Jesus, there would be something very wrong if in your pursuit of her holiness, she is perpetually miserable. That should not be. I could tell you what's probably going on there. Either the husband is self-serving and he is claiming to pursue his wife's holiness when in fact he is not, or husband, you might have good intentions, but you might be going about it all the wrong way. Notice what Paul says. He says, husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. It is possible, husband, for you to purpose something good, but just to bungle it in the execution and make her miserable in the process. We need to be very careful how we lead our wives. Their submission should be joyful because they know this, because they know that you have their best interest at heart. That's why you can submit to Jesus in joy, isn't it? Because you know that no matter what hard providences he brings into your life, what's his intention? You're good. And husbands, if your wife doesn't know that you desire her good above everything else, then she will be reluctant to submit to you. And so husband, you need to make it clear, you need to demonstrate to her that you love her and that every decision that you make is with reference to her and her growth and grace. That, wives, is how you can submit with joy when you see and when you appreciate and when you know your husband has your best interest at heart. Now we come to the husband's responsibilities. Marriage is to be marked by joyful submission and also by loving leadership. Now you notice that the word leadership is not in the text. However, it is implicit. Because if the wife's expectation is to submit to her husband, then she is submitting to the husband's leadership to his authority. Now, as we did last time, let's talk about what leadership is not. Leadership, men, is not keeping your wife under your thumb. Paul says, do not be harsh. We are not taskmasters, nor are we slave drivers. When we come home from the office, we are not to put our feet up on the coffee table, bark orders at our wife, and to lay there like a Homer Simpson the rest of the evening. That is not what leading is. Leadership is exercised and it is seen through loving, self-sacrificial service towards your wife. 
You don't want to know what leadership looks like. It doesn't look like the leadership that the Gentiles love to lord over those that are under them. No, Christian leadership looks like service. We're not to be harsh. We're not to be hard with our wives. Paul says in Ephesians 5, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, listen to these two verbs, but nourishes and cherishes it. Husbands, if you asked your wives, do I nourish you? Do I cherish you? What would she say? How would she respond? These two Greek verbs are about as tender as you get. Nourishing and cherishing your wife. Do these mark your marriage, men? Do these mark the way that you treat your wife? Marriage and leadership in marriage is not a license to do as you please, when you please, and however you please. Leadership, headship, does not excuse you from listening to your wife. Men should listen to their wives. God gave our wives brains. He gave them intelligence. He gave them a perspective that you and I do not have. Remember, it's not good for man to be alone. So we shouldn't make decisions alone either. We should take into account our wife's perspective. She is not disrespecting you or undermining your authority when she respectfully asks questions and offers an alternative to your tentative conclusion. That is not disrespectful. That is not a usurpation of authority. That is leveraging your wife's gifts and her graces and her insights to make a good decision. William Hendrickson says it very well, how leadership works and how men relate to women, especially in moments of decision. It is true that the primary responsibility for the final decision with respect to a matter rests with the husband, but the method of reaching that decision leaves ample room for mutual deliberation and gentle persuasion, in the course of which, perhaps, at times the husband's tentative conclusion may finally prevail, and at other times, the wife's, having convinced her husband that her perspective was right. Man, we need to listen. We need to listen and be marked by our understanding toward our wives. And marriage, third and finally, is not a trump card to be played whenever it is so convenient. A man who needs to constantly appeal to his authority and enforce it with an iron fist is either a very insecure man, one who lacks the ability to persuade and to convince his wife of the virtues of the decision that he makes, or he is actually sinfully running roughshod over his wife and has no good explanation for his behavior and just kicks it up and says, well, God says so. That is an abuse of leadership. And it is no wonder why some women, and men even, are hesitant to enter into marriage, because who wants that? Who wants to submit to a man like that? Would you want to submit to a man like that, men? Would you like a boss in the workplace who treats you that way? No, then why would we ever treat our wives that way? Husband, if your intentions truly are for your wife's well-being, you should be able to make the case, lay out the various perspectives, the costs and the benefits of the decision and even if you don't see eye to eye, she should be persuaded and at least convinced that you love her and that you're not doing anything to harm her. You should be able to do that. What is leadership, loving leadership? Well, it's manifested in loving service, as I said. Loving service towards our wives. Why do we say service? It's not in the text. Because if marriage is to be a reflection of Jesus' love for the church. How does Jesus manifest his love for the church? In serving her. In being head over all things for her and, and giving her good gifts. And having his mind and his attention focused upon her and her well-being, that she'd be built up as the spotless bride, as Paul says in Ephesians 5. Jesus came to serve. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
Leadership in marriage and love is not about what you take, it is about what you give. And husbands, you are commanded to give your very self. You're not just called to lay down your life if there was a firing squad tomorrow. You are called to lay down your life and you are called to die to self-interest every single day. I think sometimes we, we can say, well, I would do that if ever called upon. You're called upon to do that now. Your life is not your own. You live towards your wife, just as your wife lives toward you. It's not about getting something or getting over on the other person. It is about giving. One pastor said it so well. He said, husbands, do not exercise an independent headship standing aloof on a pedestal while the wives kneel and scrape on the floor beneath. Rather, it is a headship that ministers to the wife, a headship that is concerned about her. It is a headship in love that is oriented toward doing all things towards one's wife. Headship means love, that is, the giving of oneself. It is his task and his joy in all his decisions to bring his wife into focus. He must make decisions in reference to his wife. As Christ acts with his church in view, the husband must act with his wife in mind. To what extent are you to pursue her holiness, men? To the point of giving up your own interest. Remember, you have to be very careful to distinguish between holiness and happiness. They're not exactly synonymous, but nor are they mutually exclusive. But before God, you're going to have to give an account one day for how you led your family. And all the secret intentions of your heart will be opened and God will see whether or not you led the family for self-serving purposes or for self-sacrificial purposes. Do you love your wife? Do you give yourself up for her? Would she say that you do so? That's a good question to ask. And another pastor, he, he had this very intriguing insight, sort of a concluding application for the husbands. Love is primarily your duty. Love is primarily, the presence of love in the family is ultimately the husband's duty because after all, he is the one that has to give the answer to God. Listen to what he says. If there is no love in your home, husband, it is your fault. Principally, the responsibility for love in the home falls not on the wife, she should show love, of course, but on the husband. You see, husband, you are to love your wife as Christ Jesus loves the church. Listen to 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. If you are going to emulate the love of Jesus for his church, it is up to you to initiate that love. You cannot plead, I can't love her because she doesn't love me. Jesus loved you when you had no love for him. So perhaps today you may find yourself in a loveless marriage. And you're both staring at each other, waiting for somebody to make the first move. You're waiting for somebody to get lovely, so that way you can start loving them. Husbands, hear me. It's your job. You are to make the first move. You are the leader of the family. Paul's command, very explicitly, is for you to love your wife, not to be harsh with her. You must make the first move if you are the leader of your household, and you are. Look at the picture of Hosea pursuing his wife in love, though she had little to no love for him. What is that a picture? That's a picture of the love that Christ has for the church. That's a picture of his pursuit of us while we're still sinners. Husbands, reflect the love of Jesus towards your wife. Pursue her even when she's less than lovely. That's how Jesus pursues you. You see, the model and the motivation is all gleaned from Jesus. If our marriages looked like this, if our marriages actually looked like loving leadership, self-sacrificial leadership on the part of the husband, and a joyful submission on the part of the wife, then who could deny marriage? Who would avoid the blessing that is marriage? No one in their right mind. And so Christians, what an opportunity you have to model to the watching world the love that Jesus Christ has for the church that he has for you and the love that perfumes and pervades your marriage. Honor each other. Marriage is to be marked by mutual service. The manner of service will differ, 
For the husband, he leads. For the wife, she submits. You are to serve one another. And if both partners are faithful to do that, and the marriage is fruitful and it is beautiful, that will have impacts on the world around you. Your coworkers, your family members will look at your marriage and say, what is it that unites you? Ultimately, it is the love of Christ. The power of his spirit. And this power and this Christ can be yours. This love is, is not inaccessible. It's not too good to be true. You can have a marriage like this because you can have a Christ who loves you like this. And you can do that today. You can accept this free gift of God's grace offered in Jesus. And having been transformed in yourself through that love, you can transform even a broken marriage. With this kind of love, with this model, with this motive, and with this power given by Jesus. The mark of a Christian marriage is joyful submission and loving leadership. Submission like that, which the church is readily to offer to her lovely Savior, Jesus Christ, and loving, service-oriented leadership like Christ exercises towards his bride, the church. Christian, through the power, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Through the Spirit, you can do all things. And so go and do this. Go and be this kind of husband, men. Go and be this type of woman, wives. And in so doing, watch and see what kind of impact that will have on those around you when they have and then they see that picture of the way that Jesus Christ delights to have love and mercy upon sinners. Let's pray. We thank you, Almighty God, for marriage. We thank you for the good times and for the bad. We thank you for the sanctifying power of marriage and how when our hearts are in tune with your law, our holiness eventually comports to our happiness. We pray, Father, for those here today who, whose marriage is struggling, that you would show them that just as there is hope for wretched and guilty sinners, so too there is hope for two Christians whose marriage is less than ideal at this moment in time. We pray, Father, for those that are single, that they would desire after marriage, that they would see what Scripture has to say and that they would pursue it with ready, readiness and not reticence. And Father, that we would, as a church, be one, one corporately, composed of marriages that are characterized by oneness, one heart, one mind, one soul. Father, we pray for this church as that you'd strengthen and sweeten her marriages in order that we might show the sweet love of Jesus Christ toward us. In his name we pray, amen.
Amen. And now, church, look up and receive your Father's benediction. And now may the grace of Christ give you peace at all times and in every way. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.